Upside Down in the Middle of Nowhere, Chapter 2. Mama Jean, turn off that TV and come for, sit for supper. Mama called for Mima from the kitchen. Mima had been glued to nothing but weather television station and barely even looked up to say, hey, when we got home. The year before, she was so fixed on missing a simple, single episode of that genius man on Jeopardy that she straight up broke one of Mama's big supper time rules and took to eating her meals in front of the TV. Mima clicked off the television and shuffled over to the table, mumbling under her breath about needing the good Lord to do something. I sure don't like the looks of that storm, Mima said to no one in particular, and she sucked in her belly so she could scoot past the twins' high chairs lined up on the side of the table. It didn't make no difference to Mama what else might be going on. If there was eating to be done, she wanted us sitting at her table. Mama loved that oversized stuffed table, scuffed up table, especially when the eight of us were taking up space around it. Well, Mama said, I don't think that storm is anything we need to fuss about at the supper table, Mama Jean. She scooched her chair up to the table and went straight to fixing plates for all of us kids. Baked macaroni and cheese, pan-fried pork chops, collard greens, and Mima's sugar top cornbread, and a big old pitcher of ice down sweet tea. Mama had outdone herself again. We were all sitting around the table. Daddy had made out of his old high school gym floor, eating and taking like eating and talking like always. With the high chairs pushed up to the table and the rest of us all gathered around in our mismatched chairs, it was shoulders and elbows. There wasn't even room for a night crawler to shimmy through. I was fixing to tear into my second pork chop when I remembered an interesting fact I learned at school. Daddy, you know what my teacher told us today? Armani, I don't want to talk I don't want you to talk with your mouth full, Mama said even without looking up. She kept on right she kept right on cutting up the meat and tossing it into the table in front of Ky Kayla and Colleen. They didn't use the high chair trays no more since the springtime when they were three. What did your teacher tell you, Daddy asked. I swallowed and sat up straighter in my chair. Well, she said that yesterday somewhere in Idaho, Idaho a cow gave birth to a chicken. Georgie told my older, not smarter brother, spit a wad of half-chewed pork chop across the table. He put his fist up to his mouth and started cracking up. He threw himself back on his chair so hard he just about fell over backwards. Oh my God, you're so stupid, Armani. The boy was laughing at so out of control, tears were streaming down his ugly face. I ain't stupid, I yelled, you're stupid. His heat filled my cheeks. My head throbbed, and I slumped into my chair, wishing an only child, wishing I was an only child so I didn't have to be in the same room with that thick head people like Georgie. That's enough, Georgie, Daddy said, trying to stifle his own laugh. Mima and Mama chucked and shook chuckled and shook their heads. My whole face was on fire. I'm sorry, Daddy, Georgie said, shaking his head back and forth wiping tears and holding back more laughs. But that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. A cow having a baby chicken? What'd they call it, Armani? Cow, cowicken? Everyone at the table was laughing except for Seely. Or wait, wait, I got it. How about Chikow? Chikow, Chikow, Kyla and Kaleen sang, moving their shoulders up and down. They were banging away at the tabletop, doing some kind of chicken high chair dance, singing the ridiculous word. My whole family was acting like fools. Why are you all smiling, looking so crazy, I whined. Is that true, Armani? Celie asked with big puppy eyes. She was interested in what I had to say. Yes, Celie, it is true. My teacher even said it was on the news. Lord have mercy, Mima said. Then your teacher's a dummy, Georgie said, shoving a pile of collard greens in his mouth. Mr. Curtis, I think that'll, that will do, Mama said to Daddy, but her head nodded at Georgie. Shut up, Georgie. You think you know everything, I hollered. Daddy wasn't laughing no more. Well, I know more than you do, Georgie mumbled under his breath, still, breath still feeding his face. Yeah, right. That's why you barely made it to the sixth grade, I said, putting sass behind my words and slide in a slide to my head. Daddy stood up. I can't speak for Georgie, but I'm smart enough to know that when Daddy goes up and stands like that, it's best if I just shut up altogether. Your mom is right. That's enough, Daddy said. Understood? Yes, sir, we fussed at the time. Daddy sat back down. Before he went to eating, he turned to Georgie. I don't ever want to hear you speak disrespectful towards a teacher again. I know Armani's teacher, and she's a good woman. A good woman with a vivid imagination, Mima sat into her napkin. Mama bit down on her bottom lip, shaking her head at Mima. I see my opening and took it. You need to speak respectful to your sister, too. Oh, Lord, Mima coughed. Here we go. In your dreams, Georgie said. His voice sounded like a whiny little girl's. Celie leaned in so close to me, I could see your food stuck in the back of her teeth. I can't wait to get to fourth grade, she happy whispered. Y'all learned so many interesting things. After suppy, supper, Daddy handed out chores. Georgie had to cut the grass, and I had to clean up the kitchen. I didn't care. 
I'd rather clean kitchen, clean 10 kitchens than push that rickety old contraption across the yard. The blades on that thing were so dull it took going back and forth over the same spot at least 20 times before the grass looked even close to cut. Mama had K- Colleen in the bath and Daddy was outside most likely supervising dim with Georgie. Mima was sitting in the living room watching her s- s- sacred weather channel talking with Celie about some book called Roll of Thunder. I couldn't hear exactly what they were saying, but it didn't surprise me none that the two of them would waste their time discussing a book about storms. Mima was would be getting Celie all worked up about the weather. It was only a matter of time. I was done washing except for the big old black cast iron skillet Mama used for frying up the pork chops. I still couldn't believe how stupid Georgie was, and I wasn't in no mood for scrubbing that skillet. Every time I washed that heavy thing, I got a crick in my neck. It had to weigh at least 100 pounds. I was fixing to start on the bothersome blob of iron when Colleen's little cars rolled right over my bare toes. Kayla was tucked under under the gym floor table playing with the cars Colleen had for his birthday present. It didn't make no difference to Colleen that his twin had them because he had never played with them anyhow. He was always too busy being snug up against Mama. If Kyla was wearing pockets, you could get good. You could bet good money the girl had a ch- tiny car sho- shoved into one. Mama had washed the cars in the laundry more than once by accident. I used to get my foot. I used to roll my the tiny car back to Kyla, and she looked at me and gave me one of the famous chubby cheek smiles, and I smiled back. And I gave her the "I love you" sign with my soapy fingers. My cousin Tay Tay had taught me how to do it when we were out on the summer break. And I've been trying to teach the sign language symbol to the twins, but they couldn't get their pudgy little fingers to stand up straight. I was fixing to walk over and help Kyla situate her fingers when she stopped me cold and looked dead straight in the eyes, singing, Chicao, Chicao. She scooped up the itty bitty cars and took them running across and took off running scared like a fat little bunny. I grabbed the wet red cheek dish rag out of the soapy water and threw it at her, but she scooched quick around the corner just then. And Mima came walking toward me around the same corner. The slopping wet rag sl- slapped her, her smack in the middle of her face and stuck there like flypaper. My hands flew up to stifle the scream that wanted to leap out of my mouth. Mima froze. She stood there with the rag covering her whole face, dirty dishwater dripping down her house dress. We're still both still as statues, like all the clocks stopped ticking and the earth stopped spinning. Mima, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Slow as a slug, Mima took off the bottom edge of the rag. The wet cloth inched down off of her forehead slower than cane syrup, and the first thing I seen was her eyes. They just stared at me. My heart pounded harder. I was fixing to get a whipping for sure. Then, real slow-like, I seen her nose pop out. You can't tell nothing about how a person feels by looking at their nose. Even still, seeing half her face uncovered like that made my knees wobble. Then, with one final tug, she pulled that dish rag all the way down, and I seen her mouth. She was smiling, and I couldn't believe it. I thought for sure Mima was going to tear me up, but there was, but there she was, just smiling, and I gulped down a sigh of relief, and we both took the laughing. She walked over and gently swiped me upside my head. She tossed the dish rag in the sink, grabbed a towel, and patted her face dry. You're lucky, she said, that I'm in a pretend serious voice. I suppose I'm going to go ahead and let you live to see double digits, and she swatted me a good one on my butt when she strutted by, grabbing cold pork chop off the leftovers plate. Now hurry up and finish your chores, child, she said over her shoulder, and I'll be waiting for you. Sitting on the porch swing with Mima was my favorite time of the day, and whether I was doing homework or finishing my chores, I always did them without dragging my feet if I knew Mima was waiting for me. Evening time after supper was the best time for swinging. The smell of honeysuckle in the breeze, crickets singing their never-ending song, June bugs flickering about, and neighborhood after supper music spilling out into the still evening air. I never even cared about the little pieces of white paint chips peeling off the swing and sticking to my clothes. Mama kept asking Daddy to sand that old swing down and paint it, but the truth was Daddy was scared that if he messed with that swing too much, he might ruin the names on it. My papa, Mama's Daddy had made that swing with his own bare hands, and for me, Ma, when they first got married, back before there was such things as microwaves or computers, every time they had a baby, they'd go carve the names on it, making sure the swing, making the swing even more special. Then when Mama and Daddy got married they started having kids, Daddy took the carving out names on there, too. When Georgie was about to make, to make eight years old, he snuck one of Mama's butter knives and did his best to dig out the, the I sitting up between the G and the E of his carved name. But, I managed to do, but all he managed to do was leave behind a big old ugly sloppy fat letter I instead of the nice skinny one Daddy had put there. 
He said he did it because he wanted to just be George, like Daddy, not Georgie. And from then on, it looked like his name had a big old scratch. Daddy was mad for two or three days after that. There were names scattered all over that chair swing, but most times I sat resting on my back, uh, resting my back on my own name. It's been a special chair for a long time, all right. So I sat there, never minding the specks of white that rested on my head and on Mima's sh- and rested my head on Mima's shoulder. Mima, why don't we call you Grandma or Nana or something? I asked. She took my hand and sandwiched it between the sweet, be- sandwiched it all sweet between hers. I reached over and played with those loose skin on the back of her hand. It felt soft and buttery like the leather of Daddy's old wore-out Bible. I took to wondering how her veins could move back and forth like that without hurting. Well, she said, I always called my grandmother Mama, and your mama called her grandmother Mama. So it seemed natural from when my first grandbaby was born, I'd be Mama too. Georgia was your first grandbaby, right? Yeah, he was. And that sweet child started talking and gave me the name Mima. Why? I think he was trying to say Mama. There was a smile in her voice. But he came out Mima, and I've been Mima ever since. It don't bother you that he messed up your name? Seemed to me Georgie sure did like messing up names. No, indeed. I think it's a fine name. He didn't mess it up. He just named me special, that's all. He patted the top of my leg. Or she patted the top of my leg. Now I have a question for you. She paused a good long minute. That cow of yours in Idaho, are you suggesting that it laid an egg or did a whole chicken pop out? I let go over hand and sat straight up and planted my feet down firm on the cracked concrete, bringing a swing to a stop. Me, ma, I whined, giving her my full face pout. All of a sudden, I got a picture in my head of a cow laying an egg, and I seen the laugh around her eyes, and I tried to cover my mouth before it broke into a big smile, but my hand was too slow. She reached up and put my head back on her shoulder. I'm just asking, you know. Sometimes we got to think for ourselves before we start repeating our foolishness to others. That's all I'm saying. We went back to the business of swinging, and we weren't talking or nothing, just swinging. My white foot was right foot was wrapped around her left foot, and it was like we were one big old foot pushing down on that square of concrete. When the swing slowed down, we knew that the exact same minute that it was time to push again. The high squeak, low squeak, high squeak, low squeak sound of the rocking made me feel, made the feel good feeling better. Being with Mima was easy. Every time the huge, fern, every time the huge fern hanging from the porch above Mima's head brushed against her updo, she'd reach up and slap herself in the head. I tried hard not to laugh, and it looked like she was swiping a fly. Except there wasn't no fly; it was just an overgrown plant hanging outside Mama's kitchen window. Right when I thought she might have forgot, Mima reached into the half-torn pocket of her favorite yellow house dress and plucked one of them hard caramels she knew I'd walk all the way from New Orleans to Jackson, Mississippi for. And she handed me that little piece of heaven, and then she pulled out a second one. She opened hers, and I opened mine, just like we've been practicing for years. And I plopped the candy I was holding onto in her mouth, and she plopped hers into mine. We rocked and sucked on our candies, watching the trees sway side to side like they knew our secret. My, 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 ain't this nice? Hmm, was all I said. After my candy was gone, but while the sweetness of it still lingered, I stared up at the honey-colored sky, tilted my head back, and settled into Mima's shoulder. I closed my eyes and listened to the wind, and it was stronger and thicker than usual, moving from here and there, blending in just so much with the sound of Mima softly humming, a hymn from the church last Sunday. The porch swing added rhythm with its high squeak, low squeak, and the screen door smacked open. Mima, they're coming out on the TV after the commercial break with an update about that storm, Seely rudely interrupted. Girl, are you serious, I said, sliding my head back with a lip curled up to one side, making sure that she knew with more than my words how aggravated I was. Can't you see we're busy? But just as quick as a swap, Mima scooched herself to the edge of our swing, bearing most of her weight down on my thigh, and she umped herself up out of the chair. Her sweet caramel breath floated down and settled in my deserted lap, leaving me to swing half crooked by myself, and she tapped the loose arm of the chair without even so much as looking back at me. Hold the door, Steely, I'm coming. The plump purple uh, muscadines hanging from the from the vine called my name. The grapevine was another one of Mama's babies, and it spread from one end of the chain link fence clear to the other side, where Daddy kept his homemade charcoal grill. I lifted a few of the top vines because the fat, dark grapes are almost always hiding underneath. Everybody knows that the darkest ones are the juiciest and the sweetest. I found what I was looking for and plumped the yummy grape in my mouth, and I about choked on the dang thing when Georgia tapped me on the shoulder. Hey, what you doing? I rolled my eyes and ate another grape. Making a pie. Of course I wasn't, but a stupid question deserved a stupid answer. And I spit a seed over my brother's shoulder. 
Georgie plopped his own grape from a top vine onto his mouth, and he wiped the muscadine drool off his shoulder and said, the Babineaus are out front loading their car with suitcases. The Babineaus were our neighbors. I plucked another grape from Mama's vine. Why, are they taking a trip or something? I guess Mr. Babineau told me they were evacuating because of the storm, and he picked up another grape. I all but sucked an entire grape right into my lung, and a tiny thump started in my head. I said like the word smelled bad. Yeah, he says, I shouted, tell, tell Daddy they're heading north, probably to Mississippi, he says. We should pack up and head north, too, while we still can. Without even thinking about it, I grabbed a hold of George's shoulders and got up in his grinning face. My heart was still thumping like a snare drum at a jazz funeral. You didn't tell Daddy that, did you? Georgie pulled his face as far from mine as he could, bringing an old, shrunk grin right up to the glass as we were hanging the tip of his fat, sweaty nose. Not yet. George, you gotta promise me you won't tell Daddy. He wiggled out of my grip and pushed his glasses back into place with his finger. Why shouldn't I tell him? Maybe we should evacuate. I couldn't believe my ears. My brother was so slow. Georgie, it's my birthday weekend. The party's the day after tomorrow. So, he said. He might as well have slapped me upside my head. So, I did my best to head slide I ever done in my whole life. He plucked, half the green gra- he plucked a half green grape off the vine and started walking for the door. I scooted in front of him, forcing him to stop. He rolled his eyes and folded his arms up across his chest. I took a deep breath and forced a smile that most likely showed too many teeth. Please don't tell Daddy. Please just don't say nothing after my party Sunday pl- until after the party Sunday. Please, Georgie. His eyes softened and opened his mouth to say something, but the screen door squeaked. There you are. Mama's looking for you, too. Daddy stood in the doorway holding the screen open. Me and Georgie stood there froze like a couple of fools. Is everything all right? Daddy stepped out of the doorway, and all the muscadine juice in my mouth dried up with sweet beads popped out across my forehead. Sure, Daddy, everything's fine. We're just eating some grapes. Georgie placed slapped my arm and walked over to the screen door. You better come on, Armani, before the mosquitoes eat you up. Daddy put his head on my brother's shoulder, and the two of them held the door open, waiting for me. Your brother's right. We don't want the birthday girl covered with bug bites. Yeah, Georgie said over the top of his glasses. You don't want to show up at your party on Sunday looking like you dragged yourself up out of the swamp. He laughed. Daddy shook his head from side to side, a nice smile shining across his face. I smiled so big, I could feel it in my ears.